when we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. I'm Keats Ross, and this is the Prague Magic Podcast, and boy, do I have a good episode for you today. My conversation with Lacanian psychologist and psychoanalyst, Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, couldn't have come at a better time. But, you know, that's how these interviews tend to work. You see, this podcast has been my personal grimoire as well as my continuing education, gleaning from luminaries such as Dr. Sinclair and applying and practicing the methods and wisdom revealed within our conversations. But I've recently hit a standstill in all my exploration of the self, or what I like to call subconscious spelunking, I've yet to dive deep or deeply explore professional psychoanalysis. And well, who better to discuss the merits, discern the throes, and appeal to the wonder of the psychoanalytic practice than an artist and a practitioner such as Dr. Sinclair. We discuss art as therapy, sure, but art created to investigate the metaphysical manifest of the other. More importantly, the relationships that we create and that third mind that they tether is the crux of this episode. Of course, the episode art was divined by the Disruption Generator, a custom arcana, a bibliomantic oracle that was illustrated by Outlet Press and released via our art collective, We the Hallowed, You can find it at disruptiongenerator.com. And the three cards I pulled for this episode, well, zipper, gas mask, and of course the album art and third card, wonder. And I've read this spread as unlocking with caution for benevolent wonder. And how apropos, considering Dr. Sinclair and I talk about the wonders and throes of psychoanalysis, violence, the occult, ritual, Burroughs and Geisens cut-up techniques, necromancy, and oh, so much more. So please, slither hither, weirdos and witches. Here's my fascinating, wonderful conversation with Dr. Vanessa Sinclair. I thought we could just start with going over some of your credentials and maybe some of your background in academia and whatnot. Okay, sure. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist and a psychoanalyst. So basically, I'm from Miami, Florida originally, and I went to graduate school uh, down there in Fort Lauderdale at Nova Southeastern University. So it's a PsyD program, which means you get a doctorate in psychology. So it's a clinical degree, whereas A lot of psychologists are PhDs. They have philosophy in psychology degrees, um, and that's more theory-based. So mine was more clinical-based as a PsyD. And then I originally wanted to go into psychoanalysis in the first place, but I didn't really understand before I went to grad school how divided the field was, and that really mainstream uh, graduate schools don't even teach Freud even at all. (laughs) So my school was really cognitive behavioral and uh, behavioral at that. And uh, so I sought out psychoanalytic training after I finished my graduate program, which was another like three to four years it takes. Okay, very cool. And so I was in New York. I was in New York? 
Yeah. Yeah. So I've been a fan of yours for quite some time uh, from Rendering Unconscious, the podcast. I've really enjoyed that. Also, your experiments and cut up technique with uh, Chaos of the Third Mind, right? And um, God, like you've done some music and you've just been all over the place. And one thing I really appreciate about you coming from a psychoanalytic background is that you um, kind of combine the irrational and rational like schools of thought. And I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about more because you mentioned that a little bit a, a second ago about that divide between those uh, practices. Sure. Well, in, psych- in the field of psychology itself, um, I mean, the way I understand it is that like behavioral theories and cognitive behavioral theories have their own point of view and they're valid in many ways as well. Um, and But I see humans as like much deeper and I didn't really understand that there were people that just only focused on like us as animals at like through behavior. Like, of course, like if you are depressed and you go outside and take a walk three times a week, you'll feel better than somebody who doesn't go outside and take a walk three right. times a week and just stays home in bed and watches TV. Yeah. Like that just kind of sounds like sense to me. Um, but there's a lot of other things people can do <laughs> besides that or besi- besides reframing their thinking, like instead of going back into this anxiety spiral that I've been in, why don't I take a breath here and go to the gym and like try not to go on that like downward spiral of train of thought I've been on a million times, you know, right. and those things can help in the moment. But as I see them, they're more like coping skills like ways to cope with stress but like why are we stressed in the first place Mm -hmm. and that's where psychoanalysis I feel is really important and then through my psychoanalytic training um I went to a school that I thought was very Freudian but it wasn't as Freudian as I thought it was going to be um when I went through the program and so while I was in that formal training program I started studying Jacques Lacan on the side uh, and taking like study groups um, with Lacanian analysts. And that's how I became more Lacanian. Um, And that's when I started learning about the idea of scansion and the cut. Um, And then I realized I had already been like a fan of like Burroughs and Geisen's work and Genesis Peorage's work and that sort of thing. And so when I started studying Lacan, I started seeing how his theories were applicable to these artists that I liked. Right. And so I decided that I wanted to start writing about that. So I wrote a few like shorter essays. And then I realized at some point somewhere along the way that like maybe instead of just thinking about what's going on when these artists are creating, maybe I should try it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what they were doing. It was just specifically from listening to Burroughs. Like you can find like videos of him talking on YouTube, mm-hmm. but it's like he's going to audiences and everyone, you know, thinks he's so cool and he's reading these poems or whatever, but he's trying to tell everybody that they should do it too. Right. And so I realized like he wants us to try it. So why don't I try it? So I started cutting up the writing that I was writing about the artist that did cut ups. Very cool. <laughs> That's how that, that started. Yeah. So it's it more of a, do you look at it as a more of a therapeutic practice then? Or is this more you're 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 trying to journey or what I call like spelunk into the subconscious like intentionally? I think it can be both. I yeah. mean, I think that what I've found from um undergoing psychoanalysis and like walking other people through their own psychoanalysis. Um, and then also having an artistic practice mm-hmm. is that they are very therapeutic and they are very, they're both very creative as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that humans have an, an inherent creative potential that we need to express constantly. And even people that don't find themselves to be particularly creative, you know, they always do something that is creative, like they cook or they garden or something like that. Something where you're like, taking the world around you and changing it in a way that you want you know and and like implementing your intentions and your will in that way Mm -hmm. so I think they're both essential yeah that's been my obsession is that confluence between art and like metaphysics but more in the self alchemy and sort of you know trying to fight those patterns or I think you were talking about in one of your podcasts a father figure and how Mm -hmm we're kind of implemented with this narrative when we first come out of the womb, you know, and it's been my, my personal practice or my, my want or will to like maybe change or morph those, you know, more sour 
developments and, you know, become a better person or whatever. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that. What, what kind of narrative, I, or I should put it like, what kind of uh, methods can we use personally, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the cut is like, yeah. I mean, I'm writing a book right now called Scansion and Psychoanalysis and Art. And it's exactly about this. It's kind of the result of this project. Like I, like I was started writing about it and then I kind of went off in this tangent where I've just been making my own art and that's yeah. been really fun. And yeah. then I decided at a, a point last year that I should go back to writing that book that was my original intention before I started kind of making music and artwork of my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess it's like about four or five years ago now. Well, you um, applied the data, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now I, I've seen in my own life how it works, which is yeah. also what happens to you in psychoanalysis. It's like you can explain... Freud's theories and Lacan's theories all day long to people and it's just you know intellectualization really until somebody sees how they're at work and at play in their own lives right Um, so I think that's why having a personal practice is essential um yeah but I think the cut is really fantastic because everybody can do it actually really easily and you don't need to feel like you have any skill or able to draw and it doesn't really take a long time. You don't have to dedicate yourself an hour a day, six days a week to psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. And that's great too. But if you just want it, something to start with that anybody can do, it's like you don't even need to have your own writing. You can just grab like a newspaper or a magazine or whatever is nearby and just take scissors to it. Or even just tear it up and yeah. stick it in a bag and rearrange it and then see what it says when it comes out. Um, and it's a lot more surprising, I think, than people realize unless they've done it themselves as well. Now, obviously, uh, because of your psychoanalytic background, when these patterns kind of, you know, come up, do you think those were intended or do you think there's something a little bit more metaphysical when the construction happens? I think people can see it either way, however they want, whatever's comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the very least, I think it's the way if people say, oh, it can't be the universe or whatever, or the other speaking to us, right. it's our own projection. That's great too. Because basically as an analyst, most of what people do and interact with is their own projection. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> that's so- the console point is you're never like really meeting someone when he says like, you know, there is no sexual relation. It means you're never really meeting someone one-on-one. You're both projecting onto one another. Totally. So, but if you make these items and you, get something out of what they say to you or what you think that they say to you, mm-hmm. what's the problem? Yeah, I agree. And wouldn't that uh, where the third mind kind of comes from too? It's that that third, when you're working with somebody, that third kind of projection of both of your intentions together. And so you've exactly. been doing that with Caitlin Fosey, the artist. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about chaos of the third mind. Sure. Um, that's been probably even more eye-opening than the cut-up techniques themselves is I was doing it by myself and then I met Caitlin and she was already doing it in her life and then we realized we could start doing this together and then we realized that we could have one of these third minds as well just like Burroughs and Geisen did Um, and it's been really interesting and it's kind of made me rethink uh, the way I see like human consciousness, basically. Really? Um, I can't really articulate it fully yet, mm-hmm. but there's definitely something to this idea where, and I guess the way that's easiest to explain is like when you're in a relationship with somebody and you both like kind of know what each other's going to say before you finish your sentences and this sort of phenomenon. Um, but I'm even thinking of it as that like sometimes you don't let that relationship go because of like this idea of this potential of what you can do with this other person or create with this other person. Right. And a lot of times that'll keep you in the relationship like longer than maybe you should be in it. <laughs> totally. um, it's like kind of that idea of that potential um, that it kind of takes on a life of its own. Um, and I don't really know how to explain it fully, but it seems like Caitlin seems much more present than most people I know um and even though I've moved to the other side of the world now she kind of always seems to be around in some way Mm -hmm. and um (laughs) I don't know we just kind of always are like buying the same things and and that sort of experience so I don't know I don't know how else to explain it but it's very intimate that's cool that that could almost be like a a weird faction of what you know this shared somatic reality is is that we're all just kind of 
that made your third mind in a way. I'm not mm. sure if that's like what you mean about consciousness itself and how it's shared and whatnot, but I imagine in your line of work that you're kind of deconstructing that all the time. And does that come back down to this narrative idea, this like these human patterns and kind of we're just built to do and be things from the get go? Um, that's a good point because there is um, like a strain of psychoanalysis, which is actually probably the currently the most popular strain, which is called relational psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And they, without calling it a third mind, are really into this third mind idea where like the patient and the analyst develop a third mind and that that like, I don't know, it's like part of both of them. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's true in a way, but I think I'm really hesitant to think about psychoanalysis in those terms or like a psychoanalytic treatment because because of the fact that I think that basically anyone that you start working with or like seeing like one hour, two hours a week, three hours, four hours a week, um, anyone that you spend that much time with that intimately, you are going to have this kind of mind meld thing a little bit. Right. And I think that happens with any relationship you, you uh, involve yourself in. And I think that's the point of psychoanalysis is that the analyst is not supposed to engage in that other position with the patient. Mm. You're not supposed to react the way you would normally react with somebody else. And you're not supposed to react the way that the patient is like pulling for you to react the way they usually like get responses out of people. You're not supposed to engage with any of that. You're supposed to kind of take a step back and let the, the analysis act those things out. And you're supposed to be a little bit separate of it. I see. Um, yeah. And so that's why I'm not into relational psychoanalysis and find myself more Lacanian um, because he's really into taking that space and making those cuts. And I think that that's really important for the, for the other person, for the patient. Yeah, it would seem like the whole point is to get an objective kind of, or an attempt at objectivity. <laughs> you know, I don't think anything is truly yeah. objective, but. Right, but that's yeah. what the analyst session can offer, whereas every other relationship you have is not going to be that. Right, yeah. And when you were talking about, you know, father figures and, and other, um, you, you were talking about gender and I thought it was really moving because it was that we're not adopting, we're quick to put the binary on everything and that we're not, you know, adopting, what'd you call it? Um, you said it was uh, invoking the androgen or, or uh, yeah, the androgyne. The androgyne, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I thought you could talk a little bit more about that because I thought it was really a moving idea. Yeah, I think that um, something that psychoanalysis has to offer to like contemporary discourse in time is kind of the way it's been working uh, with queer theory mm -hmm. in that the idea that, you know, originally when psychoanalysis started, they were looking for like who was healthy and who was pathological, right? But now it's at a point where uh, the understanding is that every way that a person forms uh, whether sexually or gender identity or any any f way they form at all um, is just as valid as every other way to form as a human being. So you really have to look at people more uh, individually. And of course, there are some similarities or patterns that you can make, but really everybody's kind of formations through these um, different ways um, is really individual and unique to each person. Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying that this one is better than this one, or this is the way we want to go, like has been done in the past, instead just letting everybody's experience of their world be valid. Um, and the only reason I think ever anything should be intervened is if the person is suffering, if they are coming to you out of their own agency right. <laughs> and saying that they're suffering and there's something that they want to look at or change, you know? But otherwise, the idea of like imposing these external viewpoints of like what's right or what's wrong or what's better onto people is just really violent. Um, yeah. yeah. And that kind of segues into the your book that you just released a bit, right? Uh, Psychoanalysis and Violence. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the thesis of that book, because it was seems like a heavy read. It is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's. It's a, it comes from a conference. So my friend and colleague, Manya Steinkohler in New York, mm -hmm. she's a Lacanian psychoanalyst who was trained in Paris. Um, and her and I became close friends when I lived in New York. And when I was in psychoanalytic training 
at the Nacho Freudian Institute and, and just right. starting to learn about Lacan. And uh, I was also working at a hospital in New York City at the time, uh, a government run hospital. And like it was really poorly run and filthy and the patients were treated terribly. Um, and I was really upset about seeing people treated that way, basically. And she was talking about her experience in France and also working with people that were like diagnosed as psychotic. But the way that they were working with these people were so different, like this uh, Lacanian analyst had set up this kind of little town where everybody could live and like have different jobs and like move in different spaces and like still be inpatient to where it was like kind of contained, but have a lot of movement within that kind of containment. And it was just such a different way of looking at treatment, uh, especially for really serious mental illnesses, that uh, it was very eye-opening because I couldn't ever imagine them doing something like that in America. <laughs> so yeah. we started talking about that and the difference in different worldviews from different places. Um, and we decided to basically have a conference about it. And that was in like 2014. I think our conference was um, in the beginning of 2015. And that's right when like Black Lives Matter was starting and things were starting to get like really clear on how big of a problem uh, the U.S. is having. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so we did the conference in New York, um, and I still felt pretty frustrated because I was like, well, this is great that we all like sat around and talked about it. And now everybody goes back to their offices and like isn't dealing with it anymore. So, um, I decided that we should like turn some of it into a book. And then by then, by the time we turned into a book, the election had happened and everything. And so we focused on more things more of the papers that we felt were really relevant to the times mm -hmm. um, and the kind of political problems that are going on. And then some of the other papers from the conference I put into the other book I was making, which was Rendering Unconscious. Right. So, so has, I mean, it's apropos right now because I'm, I'm in Portland right now and everything that just happened this past couple weeks, you know, it just, it seems to just keep escalating. And I don't mm -hmm. know, like if that's like what what can we do to kind of um do people need to look inward is that like where it goes first is it more reactionary based is that the scare you think? um i think that a lot of what's going on is very reactionary um but we especially the u.s has some serious serious systemic issues and like i don't think it's kind of hard to wrap your, your mind around how deep these issues are. And they haven't just started with the current administration. Right. They've been going on for decades and decades. And yeah, I think absolutely. that working in the hospital that I worked in, I got like a little taste, you know, because I'm from Miami. Uh, I lived in Eureka, California for two years, like after graduate school for my uh, postdoc uh, and then worked there. And then that was like 2007, 2008, when the economy collapsed. And they just like cut our entire counseling department yeah. um, because, of course, students don't need therapy <laughs> when the country's in crisis. But anyway, yeah. um, so I went to New York because I could find a job there. And I worked at this HIV clinic there. So it was like two, the end of 2008, I started working there. Um, and, it, you know, you have this idea of New York when you're from somewhere else in the country, basically, of like, you know, it's New York. Every, well, you want to go to New York. It's so shiny and everyone's so fabulous or whatever. And then I got there and like, there is that, but there's like a lot more problems than, than you could imagine. And like the patients that are living in like the poorest neighborhoods are really getting treated horribly. Yeah. And just being able to see the medical care system and like how heinous people were treated and like everybody that needed disability was rejected over and over and over when they had like very valid disabilities. Like somebody, one of my patients was a like a garbage man and uh, the truck ran over his legs while he was at work and like shattered his legs so he couldn't work. And it was like eight years and he was still applying for disability and he had a government job that's supposed to take care of you, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so things like that have been going on for ages. And then like the whole idea of private prisons. I mean, it's really like, and we need a huge overhaul. Yeah. <laughs> like well, really massive. What you were saying about that, like, commune in France reminds me of how, like, the um, Netherlands treats the, the prisons. Or is it Norway? I'm sorry. Yeah, the Norwegian prison system, where they kind of have this encampment community kind of vibe. And it seems, I don't know, that was just a sideline. But I was just in uh, Los Angeles, 
and you know talking about the divide like there is a new york that class divide almost it's mm -hmm. insane right now like it it really left an impression on me especially being from kind of lower income you know uh walks of life that was just astounding and i think the thing is it's it's a mental health crisis like that's what it is you know they keep saying it's you know not low income housing and all that but that that's all true but the big brash the big like uh epidemic seems to be mental health yeah and of course nobody's gonna have good mental health if they don't have a place to live you know right. yeah, yeah. i mean that's what my whole job in the hospital ended up turning into was like doing case management trying to get people their disability and trying to get them their housing and things like that because how am i going to give them therapy if they don't have a place to live that's stable you know? absolutely yeah yeah so what uh you're located in stockholm now yeah, I moved to Sweden last year. How is that going? How is that? I'm sure that divide is insane compared to... Um, yeah, it's very different um, <laughs> in a nice way. It's nice. Um, their healthcare system is really nice. I mean, yeah. I didn't even have to uh, let them know I was here or ask for doctor's appointment. It's just like as soon as I was in their system, they just mailed me two doctor's appointments. Like, oh, there's a woman this age here. She should have this and this appointment. Mm -hmm. so so it's nice yeah yeah it's nice to see that that it can exist and their prisons you know they're not for profit prisons um and they, they have like a maximum i mean i don't know all the details but i know like nobody's going to jail for life for something small you know right. i don't even know if they have life sentences even for like murderers wow yeah and so i wanted to talk so i wanted to bridge into the occult a bit and how I think I read somewhere that uh, metaphysics and, and psychoanalysis are both unfalsifiable. And, you know, like you can't really claim that they're wrong because you can't really claim, you know, so much. But I, I think that I don't know if that was an insult to psychoanalysis because I feel like that's way more, um, uh, you know, calculable <laughs> than metaphysics is. And I do believe that. But there is a bridge there, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the the confluence between metaphysics and and uh, psychoanalysis. Yeah, um, I see them like both as really creative practices, really, yeah. um, and uh, like doing the conferences we've had two now on like psychoanalysis, the arts, and the occult. Um, the first one was was called that and then the more recent one we had was called rewriting the future 100 years of uh, psychoanalysis and esoteric modernism um but basically the the way we're talking about it is basically going back to like the ideas of more indigenous religions and practices and folk mag magic practices um and like letting them be valid again in a western academic space um rather than people writing them off as these kind of the way the colonists did with the, these primitive savage practices or whatever right. that are like childlike and that sort of thing. Um, so we have a lot of practitioners from like Santeria or Kimbanda or Voodoo um, come and speak to psychoanalysts and artists. Um, and it's a really nice mix because they're all like very creative, open-minded thinkers, mm -hmm. um, especially probably the most closed-minded ones would be the analysts, I would say, <laughs> but the analysts that come are open. Um, so that's good. Yeah, um, I yeah. And I feel like, I mean, everybody assumes because I'm open to uh, the occult or occult ideas that I must be Jungian um, because right. that's kind of Jung's gotten like all of that uh, ever since Freud and Jung broke up 105 yeah. years ago or whatever. Right book and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Jung's nice and I like his work, but I don't use it in my psychoanalytic practice. Um, and I think that you can look at these ideas through like Freudian and Lacanian lenses as well. And more through like I was talking about earlier, just the gender and sexuality and every avenue being just as valid as any other. So mm -hmm. our ways of being and working in the world. And if you put herbs together and it feels like it has a result for you, then you want to do that. You should be able to do that and you should be able to talk about it or you follow the moon cycles like right. people have been doing for thousands of years. Yeah. <laughs> um, you should be able to talk about that in your analyst's office without having someone tell you that you're like on a road to psychosis because people have been doing these things for a lot longer than like Western thought and medicine has been around. So, yeah. Uh, 
I'm just I, trying to make the academics realize that the the point of view because I feel like academics understand that like you know racism and like wa- ga- uh, gaps of wealth are like clearly caused from colonialism but I feel like nobody seems to understand that them like looking down on other people's practices um, in those contexts is also like very racist basically yeah, and yeah. people need to stop doing that so is your idea about is it does it really come down to if it works it works is that sort of yeah yeah because mm-hmm. that, yeah that makes sense I was talking to Mitch Horowitz and he kind of has the same ideology but more so like with you know, mind metaphysics and the power of positive thought. And do you employ any kind of those ideas in, in your uh, practice and in, in your clinic? Um, it's more that I won't uh, pathologize other people for okay. employing those ideas. Okay. So yeah, yeah. if people have Googled me, they might have seen what I do. Um, <laughs> and they might know that I'm open to those kinds of things. Right. But I don't bring them up because I'm really... Okay. I really don't want as an analyst to impose my views on other people, but it's more that I won't pathologize you for having those views. Cause like when I was in psychoanalytic training at the Institute that I went to, mm-hmm. my uh, analyst was like very rigid ego psychologist, which is all about like shoring up your defenses. And like, they have the belief that the way that the patient gets better is by internalizing the ego of the analyst, which I find really gross. Right. <laughs> basically i don't want your ego thank you (laughs) (laughs) um and so anytime i would talk about any of my ideas or dreams or whatever um he would always be like oh there's you and your magical thinking again ha 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 and be like you know i'm not psychotic do you think i'm psychotic because i'm not Mm -hmm. um and even if i was does that mean i'm not a valid person with my own points of view and i can't be in the world too you know so, so it's really about depathologizing people's experiences. And even in, in like graduate school, like when you're becoming a psychologist, it's like they teach you when they're teaching you the DSM and everything, they teach you, well, if somebody's from this or that background, like if they're from a Caribbean background or, or if they're from a Haitian background or Cuban background, this is in Miami, um, then, then it's okay if they like see their dead grandmother or something. But if they're a Caucasian person from Alabama, then it's not okay. And uh, I find that really awful and strange as well. Yeah. Is there, um, uh, in your own personal like belief and practice, you do you kind of consort with the other? Is that part of your understanding? I'm really into necromancy. Oh, yeah? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I like working with the dead, okay. whether it's the dead, um, dead ancestors of mine, like blood ancestors, like my grandmother or something like that. Um, or what we call adopted ancestors, which could be like, like Burroughs and Geisen, uh, or Lady J by a Peorage who's yeah. deceased. Anybody right. who's already passed on that's influencing your writing or your work. And I found a lot of artists do that, you know, like a lot yeah. of artists, um, take in other things from artists or like want to visit the other artist's grave or like bring them something or have a little space for them or like reference their work a lot in their own work um and that to me is like a form of necromancy and you can see that as you know a creative practice or you can see it as actually communing with the dead Mm -hmm. wow that's that's beautiful actually i never really thought of it that way but that makes so much sense because it is like inspiring the actual practice of creating and so it is kind of allowing someone else's will to kind of help guide in a way. That's really cool. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things that Burroughs said was that artists live on in their words. So yeah. his favorite poet was Rimbaud. And he said, you know, he's read all the Rimbaud that exists uh, and he's dead. So he can't read him anymore. But then if you cut him up and you rearrange his words, then it's still him and he's saying something new. And I think that's wow. really beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I think as, as a society, we need to start respecting ancestors more um i feel like in america that's been really stripped away Mm -hmm. and people don't aren't really connected to their roots uh for the most part um Mm -hmm. and so i think that's a big part of the problem that we're seeing is like not being connected to the land that you're on and the people that originally inhabited it and and not being connected to your own past and history and ancestry i've done a lot of work recently kind of ancestral wise and i'm finding there's like um there's barriers between 
like a, a deeper connection to some of my ancestry and and whatnot. And it is more a kind of an adoptive idea, but I'm worried and I'm always like really um, careful about, you know, the sense of appropriation and, and that idea. And I was wondering, well, how do you, how do you feel about the adoptive ancestry? Like, well, I think practice? if you're working with your own blood ancestors, you never have to worry about right. appropriation because they're right. yours. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, the easiest way to do it is just like have a picture of them and a cup of water and a candle and just like sit with it or talk to them or write while you sit with it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like a lot of my uh, friends that are shamanic practitioners, you know, you could see someone like that and they can let you know, like if there's, if which of your dead are like still restless and which are yeah. fine where they are and let you know, like who might need more attention than somebody else. So you can kind of try to heal that. Because even in even if you're just thinking of it psychologically and not li more literally, right. um, you know, psychologists have understood now since the Holocaust that there's this idea of transgenerational transmission of trauma. And that would happen when a lot of people that did survive came over to the U.S., for example, um, and they never spoke about it again. They changed their name. They didn't want to be Jewish, this sort of thing, or they didn't want to have any more political problems, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, then their children started having symptoms or their children's children. Um, and it was traced back through psychoanalysts working with people to these like past traumas of their ancestors uh, one or two generations before. So even psychologically, people are starting to understand that that makes a lot of sense and does happen. Somehow it's transmitted unconsciously yeah. uh, to the next generations. And then as far as adopted ancestors, I mean, if it's somebody that inspires you, then, you know, they inspire you. Yeah. No, absolutely. I was thinking, does that correlate to like transference in a way? Yeah. Yeah. So the <laughs> idea of like, um, yeah, I guess it is kind of adopting how, but isn't it what you and you, your interaction with them with somebody else and transferring that mode onto something else? Yeah. Transference is like when, like say your parents have a certain relationship with one another mm -hmm. or you have a relationship with one of your parents or both, then you take that kind of relationship dynamic that's usually kind of under the surface and not something that was directly addressed. Right. Um, and then you transfer it onto somebody you're in a relationship with right. currently. And, that, yeah. and people do that constantly. Like I think everyone you talk to, you're having some sort of transference with. Yeah. Do you have any, um, I don't know, do you have any methods or practices one could employ to kind of halt that and allow maybe a new relationship to form that doesn't have that baggage? Yeah, <laughs> I think for that, psychoanalysis is, is right. the ultimate um, yeah. because the reason it's different than like most other kinds of therapies, especially if you do it really kind of classically where you do see your analyst multiple times a week, um, seeing someone multiple times a week and someone that doesn't like give you advice or tell you, you should go to the gym or like tell you, you know, what to do basically that just kind of listens, tries to help you find patterns of, of transference basically. Okay. Um, but also what happens is it, when you see someone that often you, you start having a lot of transference towards them and you start acting out a bit the kind of relationship pat pattern that's problematic for you with the analyst. Right. And then, like I said before, the analyst, instead of engaging in it with you, they should be separate from it and like point it out like, hey, do you notice what you're saying right now sounds really familiar to what you said happened with your mom when, whatever. And so that you start like seeing yourself acting it out like what happens I mean it happens in regular relationships like romantic relationships too where you sometimes you're arguing with someone and you're like why am I doing this you know what I mean I do <laughs> you're just like much. yeah I think everyone's had that experience <laughs> but you're just like caught up in it and you can't really stop it yeah um and that's because you're both enacting your your transference patterns at each other mm -hmm. and that's usually why people are attracted to each other in the first place even though they don't realize it consciously it's like your unconscious transference pattern with your parents somehow lines up with theirs. And so you think this feels really great because it's really familiar because it was like happening when you were little. Right. But, so it was like really formative for you, but really like probably it's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> <The> idea <laughs> probably it's better to like try to find your own relationship pattern. 
-hmm. but it takes a lot of work and like having that's why an an analyst can be really helpful to like stop you and be like hey do you notice what you're doing Um, because if your romantic partner does that forget it you know (laughs) no absolutely (laughs) you're gonna get really angry Um, (laughs) and then you can work that out like in analysis so that you can basically see yourself in the moment in the act stop yourself, take a breath, maybe even do some cognitive reframing (laughs) or go for a run and then like try to build new relationship patterns with other people. Okay. Um, And uh, to kind of segue into relationships, uh, your husband, Carl Abrahamson, Abrahamson, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Who I've also been following and your guys' work together, you guys do trap art productions, right? Or trap art books and you guys are self-publishing. Uh, doing films, music. Um, you guys are like, I, I picture you guys as like the the international jet set couple. And I wanted to just go over a little bit. One of your emails to me, you were just quickly wrapping up what you were doing in the last couple months or the, the, in the last couple weeks. And it was heading to Morocco to spend time with master musicians and Jujuka for the summer solstice. Uh, Art opening in Zurich at the Museum of Pornography and Art, which is up July 4th through August, so that's still pertinent. Um, And Carl and you will be performing at the closing party of Kendall Jeer's exhibition in Dublin August 10th, uh, which is incredible. Like, what a busy, busy life. How How is that all going? How are you feeling? Oh, it's really fun and very different to when I was in New York. Yeah. Um, Because when I was in New York, you know, I had a New York office to pay for and a full-time job and a psychoanalytic practice. Mm -hmm. So I was seeing uh, for the first five years, I was like at the hospital from eight to four and then seeing patients at night. And then when I was just in private practice the last five years, it was still like, you know, seeing like 10 people a day or something like that. Um, And I take a lot of time off and I did a lot of events um, of my own in New York, but I didn't travel a whole bunch. Um, So this is kind of more Carl's lifestyle it has been for a long time because he started um, doing publishing when he was in Temple of Psychic Youth in like the 80s. Oh, yeah. Um, and maybe even before that, I think that might be how he got interested in them was he had his own like fanzine, like in the late 70s or something, you right. know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, so he's been doing it for a really long time. And it's, of course, obviously much easier to travel around Europe and to Morocco and stuff when you're in Sweden than it is when you're like in right. Portland example yeah um so it's been really fun and it's been really nice like Zurich was only like two hours and 15 minutes away Mm -hmm. um so that was really great and the cabaret Voltaire was like one block from the museum that we were in uh that our art exhibit is in so we got to go to the cabaret Voltaire and do cut-ups there which I was just gonna say you did cut-ups there can you talk about that a little bit um yeah it was really wonderful I'm like I knew that it was there but I didn't realize how excited I was going to be to be there um I guess because of that necromantic kind of spirit Mm -hmm. um but they have and I also wasn't sure like is it really the the original space or is it something that's like on the same block that they're calling that because you never know but it's the original space wow and um they also like haven't ruined it like you know, who knows who gets control of these things and turns it into something that's really tacky or something like that. Right. It, was, it wasn't, it was great. It was really well done. They had like cut up poems etched into like the bricks and like even etched into the windows and like you'd be walking up the stairs and you could see cut up poetry like etched into the stairs. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I it's was like the lot. Jerusalem for cut up. <laughs> that's <laughs> exactly. amazing. I went, yeah, I went into the source. Um, right. So yes, so I, so we went there two days and the first day I went, um, I, t- I took photos of all the different cut-ups that were in the art that we made for our exhibition at the Museum of Pornography and Art. Mm-hmm. And then I hadn't read them yet because I was, you know, I've been very busy. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to see what they said and I decided to wait until I was at the Cabaret Voltaire so I read, recorded myself reading them there for the first time and reading the cut-ups from our exhibition, which was really fun. And then we went back on Sunday and um, then made cut-ups there. So I actually made yeah. them. I haven't read them all yet. But. And could you talk a little bit more about the um, the Jujuka? Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, Jujuka. Um, yeah. They're kind of part of our mythology um, yeah. with the, in the cut-up world because... You know, Burroughs lived, Burroughs and Geisen lived in Tangier, and 
Geisen had a cafe in the 50s uh, in Tangier at where he actually paid the master musicians of Jujuka to come and play. So they were kind of his like house band um, in, in Tangier. Um, and they live in the mountains there um, in, in the village of Jujuka. And they have a manager that I guess for like over 10 years now has been arranging for people to come during this festival that they have in the summer solstice. Um, to come and you get to stay with the the villagers, like the musicians in their houses, and they like their wives cook for you, and um, you get to listen to them play music until like three, four in the morning every day, and it's quite profound. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a re an experience I highly recommend, and we're even thinking um, that one of our conferences on like the psychoanalysis article theme that we might have to do one in Tangier, and then like see who wants to go to Jujuka afterwards for three days because I think that would be amazing. <laughs> that sounds incredible. Yeah, I would love to know more. Um, and then finally, you are going to be part of the closing party at the Kendall Deers exhibition. Yeah. So Kendall was at our first conference, uh, Psychoanalysis Art in the Occult in London. And actually between now and then, we're also going to uh, England for 10 days. Oh, cool. <laughs> and then going to Dublin after that. Um, but uh, yeah, Kendall was at our first conference and he's a friend of Carl's and um, he's an artist. And uh, we were in Venice after our most recent conference and his art exhibition was right across the street from our hotel, which was a really funny sink. Um, so that was nice. And he actually has asked us to possibly do one of these conferences as part of his uh, upcoming exhibition next year in Belgium. So that could be happening as well, which would be really fun. But um, he's from South Africa. He lives in Belgium. And I don't know, he's an amazing contemporary artist. And he's asked us to, he actually asked, wanted us to come for the opening to do something, um, but I don't remember where we were. There was something. I think it might have been our conference. I don't know. One of I th oh, it was another psychoanalytic conference that I was doing here, so we couldn't do it. Um, but we're going for like the closing of his um, of his show, and his show is kind of themed around the Hellfire Club. So this idea of like debauchery and like excess and enjoyment. Um, and since we just had the exhibition open at the Museum of Pornography and Art. Right. For that, we made uh, this kind of cut-up film where Carl scanned all of these uh, old Super 8 porns from, like, Denmark and Sweden and Germany um, from, like, the 70s. And uh, he scanned them and then, like, overlaid them with their own material. Um, and then the, the art exhibition is actually, like, film stills from the film. And then I put collages and cut-ups on top of that. Um, so basically, at Kendall's exhibition, we're going to like have a live performance where we read cut up poetry over music uh, that Carl will make live, and then he's going to show the film as kind of the background screen. Very cool. I was yeah. wondering if you'd like to, um, uh, if you'd allow me to like use one of your uh, uh, videos, your reads of the cut ups and stuff for the end of the this episode. Oh, sure, of course. Yeah, so if you want to, if you can send me the a specific one you had in mind, or if it's, if it's my choice, if there's definitely a few that I've watched on your YouTube channel. That yeah, anything is fine. Okay, awesome. And you've got a book you're in the process of working in. Uh, what's the next publishing venture for you? Um, yeah, so the book I'm working on now that I'm so close to wrapping up, yeah. um, which is exciting, is the Scansion and Psychoanalysis in Art, and it's going to be published by Rutledge. Um, yeah and it's due next month and so it's basically kind of talking about all these different artists that use the cut in some way whether it's like photography is like cutting a moment in time or like film and like the editing of film or like sound collages and like music um cutting different music and sampling together and that sort of thing or like the cutting up of language like Tristan Zara and Burroughs and Geisen um and so yeah, that's what I'm working on now. And then after that, I have two books I have to edit by the end of the year. One is um, called On Inpatient Art. So it's basically art artists that lived in inpatient psychiatric hospitals and, and yeah, their work basically. Wow. And it's mostly Scandinavian artists. 
um, because it's with a grant from a Scandinavian university, University of Gothenburg. Very cool. And then, and then after that, we're editing a book on Ingmar Bergman's films, psychoanalytic perspectives on Ingmar Bergman's films, because that's what you do when you're a psychoanalyst and you yeah. move to Sweden. <laughs> I made a musical score for The Seventh Seal, like when I was oh, nice. years old. Yeah. Talk about cut up. It was very experimental, but um, what was I going to say? Yeah. So, um, any other events? Or is that? I mean, you've got a tie. Like, I didn't mean to make it sound like. Do you have anything else going on? <laughs> a brilliant cacophony, almost of cool things going on. No, yeah, it's um, been fun. There was, I mean, it was really nice because um, in Sweden in May there was. Uh, three conferences that I was speaking at, uh, besides the one that I organized in Italy. And so it was really nice. Um, there was one, the Society uh, for Psychoanalysis and Philosophy, and that was a uh, group of people that I met originally in New York. So there was a lot of New York analysts that came to Stockholm for that. So it was really fun, like my first, you know, six, eight months over here to like have a bunch of people I know from other places like in my new hometown yeah. um and then this other group that this Norwegian philosopher Lene Osted does um it's on psychoanalysis and politics and she's had like 14 conferences I think now um on the subject and uh she had one at the Swedish Psychoanalytic Association so it was really nice to be able to go there and to meet like more group of more Scandinavian Europeans that I didn't know already. That's incredible. Um, and for like, I just want to ask a personal question. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice for a writer who works from home as far as energy and routine is concerned? <laughs> <laughs> well, in my mind, the ideal is to like get my yoga in and do my writing and like have everything be balanced. Right. But I haven't been able personally to have that work yet. So like, uh, for example, like this morning, I woke up at six because I was going to go to yoga and then do my writing. And that I have to take Swedish for immigrants classes because uh, I'm learning Swedish. So I was like, then I'll go to that in the afternoon. Then I'll come home and talk to you. After well, it's all productive stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I did get up at six, but I decided that I just so close to finishing this book um, that I just going to like, we leave for England next Thursday and we uh -huh. got home what Sunday at like three in the morning. So uh, yesterday it was totally wiped out because our plane came in so late. Um, but since I had like nine days, I'm like, I'm just going to like get up at like six or seven every day and just write, finish this book. And I'm not going to worry about exercising and I'm not going to worry about anything else because I just need to get it done. Okay. So um, I don't know if I'm a good role model for that. No, no, it's great. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's just a just right kind of thing. So I get it. But yeah, routine has been a pain to kind of get a whole it's really hard to get into a routine i found it kind of impossible and that's why i think like like a lot of these um more punitive models are problematic because it's really hard for people to get into routines and sometimes people that are in routines are too stuck in them right. you know like a lot of times people it's one or the other yeah. so maybe it's okay to be in flux a little bit more. yeah i think that's just where i am in life is trying to like i think I said, that's just life yeah like realistically that narrative like <laughs> i'm not a sleep till 10 person but i'm also not a you know work exactly person, so. <laughs> well, exactly dr vanessa sinclair thank you so much for taking this time it's fun yeah i i really hope to get you on the podcast soon again <laughs>